There's still time to donate to Comic Relief. To donate five, 10 or 20 pounds, text the word five, 10 or 20 to 70702. Text costs your donation amount plus your standard network message charge and 100% of your donation will go to Comic Relief. You must be over 16 and have the bill payers permission. For full terms, more information or to donate any amount online, visit bbc.co.uk slash Red Nose Day. Now, the BBC News at six with Sophie Rayworth. At six, the Princess of Wales has just announced that she is undergoing treatment for cancer. Here now is a very personal message from her, which has just been released, in which she explains what has been happening in recent weeks. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This of course came as a huge shock and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment, but most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too, as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you it means so much to us both. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. But for now, I must focus on making a full recovery. At this time, I'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. The Princess of Wales with a very personal message that was filmed on Wednesday in Windsor. Well, our Royal Correspondent Daniela Ralph is with me now. A huge shock to Catherine, as she says, it's going to be a huge shock to millions of other people as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, a huge shock, as you say, to the Princess of Wales and clearly a very deeply upsetting time for her and her family in recent weeks. And what's very clear from hearing from the team around the Prince and Princess today is that this has been entirely driven by trying to protect the children. That has been the focus of the Prince and Princess of Wales in recent weeks. It is why this news has come out today. Today is when Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis break up from school for the Easter holidays. And it was felt that this was the moment to go public uh, because they are now able to protect them as parents, protect their children from the scrutiny and the spotlight that might have been going on had they still been at school. They now have two to three weeks to spend some time privately as a family. And the Prince and Princess of Wales had wanted to make sure they tell the ch children properly, appropriately about this diagnosis and give them time to take that in. So that is why it is today that we have found out. And the tone of her message, I am well, she says in that video, I hope to make a full recovery. I mean, that is, the, that is very much her tone, isn't it, her message? Yeah, we are told that the princess is feeling very positive and is very hopeful of making a full recovery. I think anybody who has just watched that video message, they will see her vulnerability in it and see how difficult things have been with her for her. But I also think that it's clearly been a very difficult time in terms of speculation and rumour. And that video is Catherine, in her own words, done in her own way, 
And the hope is that she will now be able to perhaps quell some of that more outlandish rumour and speculation about her condition. A very difficult time as well for the monarchy, isn't it? The monarchy being all about stability. That's right. It is a very unstable time for the monarchy and the British royal family at the moment. Uh, we're not going to see the Prince, Princess of Wales for some time on any kind of normal schedule of public duty. We're also not seeing the King very much either as he is undergoing his own cancer treatment. So there are two key significant figures from public life missing and it is very noticeable. But the royal family say that both are doing well, they want to focus on their recovery, having some privacy and that they will be back in business on royal duty as soon as possible. Daniela, thank you. And you've been looking back over the last few weeks and the impact that all of this has been having on the royal family. Let's see your report now. This was the last official footage of the Princess of Wales with the royal family on Christmas Day at Sandringham with her three children who she is now so keen to protect after going public with news of her diagnosis. Back in December, all seemed well as she spoke to the crowd. Thank you so much. That's very sweet of you to come and say hello to us. Yeah, well, have a very happy Christmas. But three weeks later, she was admitted to hospital for major abdominal surgery. It was in her post-operative tests that signs of cancer were found. The clamour for information about the princess's condition has been intense. This footage, published earlier this week, filmed by a member of the public, showed her shopping in Windsor with her husband last weekend. And this photo, released on Mother's Day, to ease some of the public speculation, did the opposite, with the princess issuing a statement to say she had made some edits to the image. A turning point appears to have been this Thanksgiving service in Windsor for King Constantine of Greece at the end of February. The rest of the royal family were there, but the Prince of Wales pulled out that morning, very suddenly, due to a personal matter. We now know this was around the time the princess was diagnosed and began her treatment. It has been an incredibly turbulent time for the family. The couple's priority has been to protect their children and ensure they have time to explain what's wrong to Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis. They now hope the speculation and rumours will stop as they spend time privately as a family for the Easter holiday. The princess won't be back to a full programme of public duty for some time. We may see her occasionally, but only when her medical team have approved. For now, the Princess of Wales wants time, space and privacy to deal with her diagnosis and recovery. Daniela Ralph, BBC News. Well, let's talk to our medical editor, Fergus Walsh. Now, as with King Charles, we are being given very little information about what it exactly is uh, that she's being treated for. But from the few details we have, what more can you tell us? Okay, well, Sophie, we're, we are not being told what type of cancer this is, nor what stage it was caught at. Now, both of those are crucial factors, and I'm not going to speculate on either of those. But the tone of the Princess of Wales statement is very positive in terms of recovery. What we have been told is that the cancer was found after she had this successful abdominal surgery and it was discovered once the post-operative tests had been completed and the results had been reviewed. Now she is now undergoing a course of what she described as preventative chemotherapy. That began late last month. Now, Chemotherapy is an umbrella term for any drug treatment to kill cancer. Now, it can either be uh, given to mop up any remaining cancer cells that may remain behind once there's been successful surgery to remove the cancer, or to ensure that the cancer doesn't return in the future. Now, it can be given as an infusion, but increasingly it can be given in tab as tablets, daily tablets, and the treatment for cancer has transformed I in recent years. Much of uh, daily tab tablet treatment can be taken at home. Um, in terms of the, f the future, Catherine is stressing she is well and getting stronger every day. She's 42 years old. She's only just turned 42. How unusual is it for a woman of her age to be treated for cancer like well, this? <laughs> Cancer touches the lives of every family. One in two of us will get cancer. Now, it is more common the older we get, but thousands of people every year are, are diagnosed at a younger age. A thousand people a day in the UK are given a cancer diagnosis. Now, it is 
obviously a huge shock, a cancer diagnosis for, for any family, but three million people in the UK are living with cancer. And it, I think the message at the end when Catherine urged others affected by cancer not to lose faith or hope. I think that is a key message this evening. Absolutely. Fergus Walsh, our medical editor. Thank you. Well, let's talk to Helena Wilkinson, our correspondent, who is in Windsor, where the family live and the Easter holidays approaching and the Princess of Wales making it very clear that the focus very much now for her is on her family at home. Yes, that's absolutely right, Sophie. Um, the news here in Windsor, a number of tourists outside the castle uh, just starting to hear about the news of the Princess of Wales's uh, cancer diagnosis. It will come as a shock across the world, but also to people who uh, visit this tourist town and also residents here, because as you say, uh, Princess, the Princess of Wales and her family, their three young children, uh, live here in Windsor at Adelaide Cottage, which is around uh, half a mile from from where we live and that very personal statement from Catherine we've had in the last uh, 10 minutes or so uh, where she spoke about how they've had to she and Prince William have had to talk to their three young children uh, George Charlotte and Louis uh, in probably very careful words and uh, very uh, well thought out words about her cancer diagnosis because for young children to hear that their mother has cancer will no doubt be very devastating and probably confusing as well. So what they'll be trying to do as a family is uh, stay very close, of course, and keep very private uh, here at their home in Windsor. They have been able to, uh, on the whole, while uh, Catherine has been recovering from what she has said this evening, has been, had been major abdom abdominal surgery. Uh, but they will continue, or she will continue, her recovery here in Windsor. As you say, Sophie, the Easter holidays just getting underway uh, for her three children and the family felt like, like this was the right time to go public with the news, but now they clearly want space uh, for her to continue with the, the preventative chemotherapy that she has uh, been undertaking started very recently. Helena Wilkinson in Windsor, thank you very much. And we will, of course, return to that story later on in the programme. But right now we're going to bring you some more of today's news, some breaking news that's coming out of Russia. And the news agency TASS is reporting that there has been a shooting inside a concert hall near Moscow. Our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera, is with me now. Very early stages here, very early details. What can you tell us? Well, it is early stages, but it does appear to have been a serious incident at a concert hall in Moscow. Uh, pictures on social media, which we haven't verified yet, but also reports from the scene indicate a number of gunmen, maybe between three and five in camouflage gear with automatic weapons, went into this concert hall and appear to have started started firing. There um, are scenes of, of apparent panic, people trying to escape, as we can see from some of these videos, and also hear uh, signs of um, black smoke uh, rising over that concert hall just on the outskirts of Moscow. Talk that uh, there you can see on the inside as well, uh, the concert hall, uh, people were running and hiding, it seems. Uh, possible that those gunmen also threw some kind of incendiary bomb, which might have started that fire. And you can, you can hear some of the gunfire and see some of the panic from people at what was going on. Now, we uh, don't know yet who was involved, who was behind this uh, attack. It is worth saying that a couple of weeks ago, uh, the US embassy in Moscow actually issued a warning to its citizens saying there were concerns, there was some kind of intelligence about extremist attacks and warning people to avoid crowded places, including concerts. So it may have been that there was some kind of concern about this in recent weeks about some kind of attack. But as I said, we don't know yet who is behind this or how serious it is. But uh, Russian officials are suggesting there were a number of casualties. OK, well, as we were saying, it's an ongoing situation and we will also come back to that as we get it. more information later on in the programme. Gordon, for now, thank you. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been meeting the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Tel Aviv as part of his latest efforts to secure a ceasefire in Gaza. Our Middle East correspondent Lucy Williamson is in Jerusalem and do we know how that meeting has, has gone? 
Well, it's no secret that Israel does not have an easy relationship at the moment with its closest ally. The two countries have disagreed on Israel's military tactics in Gaza, on aid deliveries, on who should run Gaza after the war. And they're also disagreeing very forcefully and very publicly on Israel's planned military operation into the refugee town of Rafa. And you saw that here today, Anthony Blinken saying as he left that a major military ground operation in Rafa was not the way to secure um, Israel's long-term security. It risks killing more civilians, wreaking havoc with humanitarian aid. Benjamin Netanyahu released his own video, separate video, uh, responding to the discussion, saying there was no other way to defeat Hamas except by going into Rafah. And he said that he told Mr Blinken that while he hoped to do it with the support of the Americans, if we have to, he said, We'll do it alone. And of course, all this is against the backdrop of talks that are still not achieving any kind of breakthrough and a US draft resolution at the United Nations today calling for a ceasefire that was vetoed by Russia and China. Lucy Williamson with the latest there. Thank you. Let's look now at some of the other news today. And West Yorkshire police say they've launched an investigation into allegedly racist comments made by the Conservative Party donor Frank Hester. Mr Hester, who's given £10 million to the Conservative Party, is reported to have said that the MP Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. The largest outstanding student debt in the UK is more than £230,000. Data released by the student loans company to the BBC shows graduates in England leave university with average debts of nearly £45,000. The organisation Save the Student called the figures truly eye-watering. The pub chain Weatherspoons has reported an eight-fold jump in profits in the first six months of the financial year. Pre-tax profits rose from £4.6 million to £36 million. The Weatherspoons founder, Tim Martin, said the post-pandemic pandemic recovery had been a slow three-year slog. Rishi Sunak has launched the Conservative Party's English local election campaign in Derbyshire. The Prime Minister raised the issue of cash-strapped Labour-run councils, saying that in Birmingham, Labour have saddled their constituents with a 21% council tax rise. Here's our political correspondent, Ben Wright. A dash to Derbyshire for Rishi Sunak this morning, gearing up for the local elections at a bus repair garage. He hopes May's poll will prove Sir Keir Starmer's Labour Party hasn't got the general election in the bag. He is arrogantly taking the British people for granted, assuming that he can just stroll into number 10 without saying what he would do. Because we all know he can't tell you what he would do differently because he doesn't have a plan. These spring elections will decide who runs important local services, but not the country. The Prime Minister ducked the chance to hold a general election on the same day. Your opponents say you're running scared of the voters. They've got a point, haven't they? No, actually, we're out campaigning for our fantastic candidates in councils, police and crime commissioners and mayoral elections on the 2nd of May. Those are all incredibly important elections and there's a clear choice. Rishi Sunat launched the Tories' campaign in Hina, a town in the heart of the Amber Valley. Hopefully, whoever comes in will think of us and um, just put something a little bit to one side for us mm. and other towns that are like us. Yeah. Do you think that the Tories can still win the next election? I'm hoping so. I'm hoping the Tories will win the next election. I don't think they will. But, yeah, I don't think they will, but I'm hoping they will. Yeah. <laughs> if, if there's a God in heaven, the Tories will not get back in. The, the government hope that the economy is starting to turn a corner, inflation sinking quite fast, that's going to make a difference. They to walk around this town and ask people and see how rich they feel. Tory tales are hardly wagging at the moment, but Rishi Sunak will be looking at May's results for glimmers of hope to lift the Tories' current gloom. Ben Wright, BBC News, in Hina. Well, the Prime Minister has also had a few words to say about a row over the colours of England's new football kit. Rishi Sunak says you shouldn't mess with the St George's flag. 
Nike has added blue and purple to the traditional red on the St George's Cross on the back of the shirt collar, as you can see here, calling it a playful update, which is inspired by the training kit worn by England's 1966 World Cup winning team. The FA says it's not the first time an England kit's had a different colour St George's Cross on it, and Nike says it won't change the kit despite some fans and pundits taking offence. Natalie Perks reports. Oh my God, it's looking unbelievable. The ones who'll be playing in it might be fans. Are you going collar up or collar down? Oh, I'm a collar down That's girl. smart, that collar yeah, down. Yeah, smart. But the shirt with the colourful cross designed to spark unity has polarised opinion. Morning, Nike Campbell here. Listen, are you cross? It's gross. It's, it's just a symbol of corporate culture that we have in this country now. Please, Nike, if you're listening, make it pink with yellow dots so it represents Mr Blobby because at the moment it doesn't represent anything. Even our senior politicians are weighing in. Obviously I prefer the original and my general view is that when it comes to our national flags we shouldn't mess with them because they're a source of pride, identity, who we are and they're perfect as they are. The flag is used by everybody. It is a unified, it doesn't need to be changed. We just need to be proud of it. So I think they should just reconsider this and change it back. Well, here it is, all 125 quid's worth of it. Now, Nike have called this a playful update to disrupt history and say that these colours were inspired by the 66 training kit worn by England's World Cup winners. But some believe the FA must have known that changing these colours would provoke some anger. My instinct at this moment in time would have been to counsel against it purely on the basis of the emotional reaction that you're likely to get, particularly in this day and age of social media. However, I must say that I think the kit as an overall is a really, really good uh, England kit. This isn't the first time the cross has changed colour on an England shirt. Most recently, in 2012, the kit featured red, green, blue and purple crosses, only without the outrage. I think it's a much more a bit, a different conversation to be had where you're going to change the lines because that's what England is. And I remember when I started seeing it on television and I think, why are they changing the cross? Why are they changing the cross? And then I thought, I didn't even know there was a cross on the shirt. So for me, I think it's much to do about nothing. The controversy didn't bother England's under-21s today as they beat Azerbaijan wearing the shirt. A chance here for Elliot, who's in, and England are ahead. Goal scorer Harvey Elliott preferred his collar up. Nike says it was never its intention to offend and the FA says it understands what the flag means to England fans and that it will be displayed prominently at Wembley tomorrow, as it always is when the senior team wear the shirt for the first time against Brazil. Natalie Perks, BBC News. Well, let's go back to Moscow now. And there's been a shooting in a concert hall there. Our Russia editor, Steve Rosenberg, can join us now with more information. What more can you tell us, Steve? Well, this is very much a developing story. It's still going on. This is what we know so far, that this evening, um, a number of gunmen burst into a concert hall uh, in Moscow between two and five uh, armed men and began shooting. Um, we don't have any official casualty figures yet, but there are reports that at least 12 people have been killed. Um, the building itself is now on fire. And again, reports suggest that uh, dozens of people are still inside the building, uh, a building that is on fire. 50 ambulances have been called to the scene. Um, so very serious uh, incident indeed happening right now. We believe that possibly uh, a number of the gunmen may have barricaded themselves inside the building. Um, that's being checked. And as I say, no official figures yet as to how many people have been killed in this. Steve Rosenberg, our Russia editor there, thank you. And of course, you can keep across that story throughout the evening here at BBC News on BBC News Online. Now, let's go back to our other main story tonight. And the Princess of Wales has announced that she is undergoing treatment for cancer. It has been a turbulent few months now for the royal family. And the vacuum of information had led to frenzied speculation about what had been happening to the Prince and Princess of Wales. David Silito reports. When, in January, a brief statement was made that the Princess of Wales was to have a medical procedure and a period of convalescence, it was meant to be a chance to escape the daily pressures of media scrutiny. They finally released a picture of Kate Middleton. However, the lack of news ended up triggering a deluge of speculation, conspiracy and debate. 
Buckingham Palace released this photo of Princess. Where's Kate? It's been crazy how much speculation about Kate has taken over the internet. You're seeing it all across the world. You're even seeing people who don't normally pay attention to the royal family getting involved and speculating and throwing theories around. You're also seeing a lot of jokes and a lot of memes. But within that, there is a core group of people, and it's a growing group, of people who are genuinely concerned about Kate and her health. On TikTok, the running total of views of videos about the Princess of Wales has now topped 14 billion. It's a beautiful shot of a mom and three happy kids. One of the drivers of this interest is this photo that was revealed to have been digitally altered. There was a personal apology, but it triggered another storm of media interest from around the world. And even when footage emerged of the royal couple at a farm shop in Windsor, there were still many wondering if this was digital trickery or a body double. Rumours also circulated that the BBC was about to make an announcement. BBC News knew nothing, but BBC Studios, the corporation's separate production arm, did. They were filming today's royal statement. The BBC Today said BBC Studios filmed a message from the Princess of Wales at Windsor this week. We would like to wish Her Royal Highness a speedy recovery. There was also an assurance there are no edits in the video. Has become the latest Relentless interest, both from the press and the public, is always going to be part of royal life. But these last few weeks have been on a different level. A reminder that in an age of social media, the less that's said publicly may only increase the level of conversation online. David Solito, BBC News. Our home editor, Mark Easton, is at Kensington Palace. Mark, let's look at the bigger picture of all this, because the monarchy is all about stability, and yet we have the king being treated for cancer. The wife of the heir to the throne is also being treated as well. These are turbulent times right now for the monarchy. Well, I think Catherine's illness, her absence from frontline royal duties is a huge blow for the palace. The slimmed down monarchy now looks dangerously stretched. The king, as you say, unable to, to do quite a lot of the public duties he would have been expected to fulfill. Prince William, uh, well, he said he will return to uh, royal duties in the middle of next month when the children go back to school. But he will, of course, want to spend considerable time with his wife and be around for for uh, George, for Charlotte, and for Louis. Um, of course, the, the Sussexes, uh, Harry and Meghan, and for different reasons, Prince Andrew, are no longer working royals. Queen Camilla, now she has stepped in on a number of occasions for the king since his cancer diagnosis, but at 76 years old, um, you know, the palace, I think, will not want to add to her workload. Um, when you look at the average age of the working royals without Kate, it is now for... Uh, 72 years old. So I think we can expect the palace uh, to look at pruning some of the planned engagements and visits that they were hoping to do. But undoubtedly, the UK monarchy is weaker without Catherine around, with a king who is unwell and a family riven by scandal and quarrel. Goodness, they are going to miss her. Mark Easton, thank you. Well, let's go to Westminster. Our deputy political editor, Vicky Young, is there. And we have been getting some reaction from political leaders to this news. Yeah, that's right. As you would expect, uh, party leaders and politicians from across the political spectrum sending their messages of love and support and wishing the Princess of Wales a full and speedy recovery. Uh, we've heard from the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, uh, saying just that, saying the Princess of Wales has the love and support of the whole country as she continues her recovery. And interestingly, quite a large part of his message here, which he put out on uh, X, formerly Twitter, he says she's shown tremendous bravery with her statement today. In recent weeks, she's been subjected to intense scrutiny and has been unfairly treated by certain sections of the media around the world and on social media. When it comes to matters of health, like everyone else, she must be afforded the privacy to focus on her treatment and be with her loving family. So pretty critical there of uh, the media abroad and what Princess of Wales has been subjected to and calling for privacy. And that is a 
theme from others as well, from the Liberal Democrat leader, Ed Davey, and also from Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, who echoes the best wishes and talks about the lurid speculation and how on top of the shock cancer diagnosis, how that must have added to the stress. And he too says, although of course, as public figures in the royal family, he says they are entitled to their privacy at this time, particularly because there are young children. Vicky, thank you. Well, the message from the Princess of Wales was made public at six o'clock this evening, putting an end to weeks of speculation about why Catherine had not been seen in public. It is a very rare and very personal message from her, and we're going to show you again what she had to say. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This, of course, came as a huge shock and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment, but most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too, as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you it means so much to us both. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. But for now, I must focus on making a full recovery. At this time, I'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. The message there from the Princess of Wales. Well, let's talk again to our Royal Correspondent, Daniela Rafa. I mean, I think it's unprecedented for us to see her talking that personally about something. She is so private, isn't she? Yeah, that's right. I think during her period in public life, I have never seen her speak as personally as this before. We don't actually see her talk that often. It's usually very much related to her charity projects. This is something very different indeed. And I think perhaps it has been a response to what's been going on in recent weeks. We have heard all of that rumour and speculation, some of it really wild and quite upsetting for the family. But this is Catherine, in her own words, speaking directly to camera, telling you how she is feeling, what's going on, talking about her family, sort of trying to block out, I think, all of the noise of recent weeks and speak directly to the public. And there's perhaps nothing more powerful than that. It's very, very difficult for any family going through a cancer diagnosis or cancer treatment um, particularly difficult for somebody like her, who is so much in the public eye. Yeah, that's right, incredibly difficult. And that's why the timing is today, because it's the start of her children's Easter holidays. And what it does now allow the family is two to three weeks away from the public eye. We won't be seeing Prince William, her husband, doing any public of du duties until the children are back at school. They now have some time privately together, away from the spotlight, to spend some time privately coping and dealing with this. And their, their key message from the Prince and Princess of Wales here is they want to protect their children. And a very difficult time as well for Prince William himself. There he is with a father who has been treated for cancer and now his own wife. Yeah, it's a real emotional burden that he is carrying at the moment, supporting both his father, as you say, and now his wife. We're told that his priority is supporting his wife going forward. We will see him doing public duties again, but his priority is his wife. And he won't be, I don't think, on a full schedule of duties 
Uh, and of course, for his father, the king, an unsettled time for the royal family, we will continue to see the king as monarch carrying out his constitutional duties in public. It's very important for Buckingham Palace that we see the king at work as he too carries on with his cancer treatment. Daniela Ralph, our royal correspondent. Thank you. Let's have a look at the latest weather now with Louise Lear. Thanks, Sophie. Good evening, everybody. Well, it's been a tale of two halves today. We've seen some rain in Kent. It's been a pretty miserable day. Eventually, the rain eased away, but it stayed rather cloudy and grey. By contrast, further north and west, it was a beautiful day in some respects because we had blue sky and sunshine, but the seas are telling the story. Very windy, gale force gusts of winds at times, and there's been a real rush of showers. In fact, in the Western Isles, you've been very lucky indeed because if we take a look at the showers, just missing the far northwest of the Western Isles, a real rash of showers through the day across northwest Scotland and Northern Ireland. The rain easing away from Kent, though, and it will continue to clear. But once that front's gone, well, it's going to open the doors for this cold air we've been telling you about for a few days. So low pressure dominates through the night tonight. A rash of showers, a cold start to Saturday morning, low single figures right across the country. And there'll be sunshine and showers from the word go tomorrow. But the wind direction plays Playing its part of frequent rash of showers, some of them falling as snow above 500 metres, some hail, some thunder mixed in there. The showers becoming more frequent across England and Wales as we go through the afternoon, accompanied by gusts of winds in excess of 30 to 50 mile an hour at times. That is going to make it feel colder than these temperatures suggest. Don't forget, just a few days ago, we were seeing highs of 19 degrees. We'll be lucky on Saturday if we get 9 or 10. But it's a brief, cool, windy spell because that low eases away. The winds lighten down and for the second half of the weekend, it'll be drier. There'll be some sunshine around, not for long, but certainly Sunday will be a better day than Saturday. With that sunshine, temperatures a degree or so up, but there's more rain waiting in the wings. And next week looks very unsettled, unfortunately. Back to you, Sophie. Louise, thank you very much. And that's it from the BBC News at six. We will, of course, have the late, very latest for you from this ongoing attack in Moscow at a concert hall. We'll bring you all of that at 10. But right now, it is time to join our colleagues for the news where you are. Goodbye. This is BBC London. I'm Assad Ahmed. This is what's on the programme tonight.